Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at Daniel 11, verse 25 and 26, etc. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study this morning. And we invite your presence. We are thankful for all the things you do in our lives, for the way that you teach us. And uh, the lessons that correct us. And we ask for your continued care and protection over each person, for our loved ones, that your angels can watch over them. And we ask, Lord, that as we look at these things, that we can see the application, not just to um, the past or to the present, but also to our individual lives and the decisions that we make each day. And we pray, Lord, that these things will give us strength and faith, and wisdom, and understanding, and that we can reflect Christ's character. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Well, good morning again. So uh, just before the study started, I was just going over some of the mathematical things with Stephen, which which we, we went through yesterday. And what I was saying is, I have to be able to somehow put this all together in a way that people can see these connections because there's just so many uh, connections, so many different threads uh, that are being brought together in just looking at this phrase, even for a time. So I I think it's something very profound. I mean, it's, and you know, and I talked a bit about just how unlikely it is. So, so we have these things that, that obviously are designed. We, we can't say that these events are not connected to each other. We have to say that the Battle of Pharsalus, the Battle of Actium, uh, the Edict of Milan, and the movement of the capital from Rome to Constantinople for the Roman Empire, that these things are all part of a structure. And that when we look at the dates that we have here in our history, November 9th, September 11th, that these are all tied together in a structure that that speaks to the 777 days, it, that means that this even for a time, if we're, we're doing a present truth application, has to refer to events in our history that we have passed through. Now, we have, we've drawn the line. We haven't put in here uh, everything in, like, the reds, right? But we will, right? Just right now, we're still... We're still looking at these things and thinking about them and trying to understand how they all fit together. So, I mean, if we say even for its time, we have the Battle of Actium. I did put a footnote, right? So that footnote says that, you know, it has all of these symbols connected with the 343 years and the 434 years of the 70 weeks, um, right? It has the symbols of, of 313, et cetera. And then, uh, just dealing with even for a time, you know, we look at, um, you know, we, we add that together, we get 11,960, 391 months and 16 days, which is 1,440 hours, you know, so it's 403 lunar months plus two lunar months. So dealing with the Islamic calendar, uh, the word time itself, 6256 is 17 years and 47 days from 9-11. To October 28th, 2018, Jeff's summary regarding the 391.5 days from October 13th, 2018 to November 9th, 2019, right? And if we add that, you know, we can get to October 13th, 2019. Um, so that's going to be one year later. I'm not sure how that works, but yeah, I see. October 28th. That shouldn't be right. I'm going to have to check that again. But anyway, what we haven't done here is really, I mean, we do have the footnote dealing with October 22 to January 6th, but there's still much more that that can be said about this. So we're going to come back to it, right? So right now we're just, we're just setting it aside. We're trying to move a little bit more ahead. Now, uh, one of the things that we have discussed dealing with these lines. So when we look at these verses is that they can go back and repeat and enlarge so that you don't have a completely continuous narrative, chronologically speaking, in Daniel chapter 11. And 
many people have tried to to have it to be that way. Um, and people try to do that with the book of Revelation as well. But it's pretty obvious that the, the Hebrews, Jews, use this, this idea of repeat and enlarge. Right? It's not it's not common for them not to use it. <laughs> we, we just see it everywhere. So um, and so we can see historically that's that's what's happening. But in that, it's also in our history going back and covering over some of the same ground. So one of the things we talked about near the end of the study yesterday was if we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south, well, that's 1989. It's also Panium, right? Or Panium, whichever it is, right? We would say that. So we had had, you know, we had had already Raphi and Panium as actual events in Daniel chapter 11. But now we have this battle between the king of the north. It's not listed as the king of the north, but it's obviously the king of the north, pagan Rome, against Egypt, the king of the south. And so that typifies Panium. Would we agree with that? Yes. Okay. And then we would have to say, well, in our history, we have marked January 6th on, on one level, so one line, as uh, Raphia. That is, the king of the south defeats the king of the north. The Democrats have defeated the Republicans, right? And that's where we kind of have to uh, go back here and and try to understand this when we when we start dealing with here. How does what's happening in the movement relate to what's happening in the world? And that's, you know, I don't know if I want to have like an, an internal and an external line because I think they're actually connected. I think we sometimes make too much difference in this external and internal. They are related to each other. Obviously, some things are more about what's happening in the movement, something, but they're connected to events that's happening in the world. But it's not really a line in the world, and I it, like a true line. It's more just those events typify things that connect to our movement, which we will see in more detail as we continue going through these things. Um, so we looked at the stirring up of this power. So originally we had Octavian in there. He, pagan Rome, the king of the north, we had Octavian before the king of the north, and I removed Octavian because... In this history, it's actually Julius Caesar, according to Swearingen. So I'm not sure why he puts Octavian there. Right. So this stirring up of his power and his courage against the king of the south, this this is the preliminary events that begin with Julius Caesar and obviously are going to be connected to Octavian as well. But we would have to say the king of the north here represents the Republicans, in our history. So remember, symbols have more than one meaning. And in each of these lines, the same symbol can represent different aspects because it's a different line. It's addressing something different. So we remember that this line here was addressing what was happening um, with this league. That is, there's a parallel between the beginning of this line with the, the Jewish Roman League uh, with 9-11, and we connect that with, with spiritual formation. But when we see that he shall work deceitfully, this is actually going to relate more directly to what's occurring in the movement. And we have Pompey representing Parminder at this point, right, for his message, right? And so this siege that that happens of Jerusalem is going to be a siege within this movement, and so the destruction of Jerusalem, we, we have to find an event for that, what, what that would parallel. I would say it would be connected with July 18, 2030 on the Julian calendar, right? So that's July 31st. And then we have uh, the scattering, this diaspora, diaspora, and how would we relate that to this movement? This would be events after July 18 on the Julian calendar, right? Because the 10th day of the fifth month. And then we'd have to say, well, what is this forecasting his devices against uh, the strongholds even for a time? Well, we could see that this related to our lines. So we're, we're going to, we're going to put that in there. So now when we go here and we say, well, this is going to go back to 
the Battle of Raffia, you know, 1989. It's going to go back to that history. Now, we can say, you know, if we looked at the movement, we can say, well, November 9th, 2019, and September 11th, and um, and uh, November 9th, 1989, that they're all kind of uh, similar symbols. That is, they're, they're related to each other. And so, you know, we could argue that maybe this has to do with, you know, things more specifically in our history after 2019. But I would say that we would go back to uh, what's going to happen, because um, here we have the Republicans and the Democrats and the symbols 1989. But, but we don't have the Republicans and the Democrats having this conflict in 1989. In, in like that is the king of the north doesn't defeat the king of the south unless we're going to say you know winning an election is is what it's about Th- this would have to be uh, so we're going to go back to that history but we're saying that it's reflecting what's happening in this history so the question is where do we place this I guess after all that rambling um, because if we say it's Paneum in response to January 6th that is Raffia then this would still be future but then we also have in this line, we're going to have the Battle of Actium. So how do we address this? Because we understand the history itself. The history itself is 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 not too hard, right? I mean, I, I don't know if we have any disagreements about this. We have Julius Caesar stirring up his power and his courage right against the King of the South, and and that King of the South is going to end up be Egypt with. Mark Antony as uh, the leader, right? So he's going to be stirred up. So the king of the south is stirred up as well. But Octavian is going to defeat him in the Battle of Actium. So Octavian, Battle of Actium, 31 BC. And then it says they shall forecast devices against him. So who is forecasting devices against who? So this part we haven't addressed. Any, any, uh, Thoughts on the original, uh, well, the pioneer, let's say, understanding of this. So he's going to forecast his devices. What would, Stephen, do you know what uh, Uriah Smith would say? I mean, we could look it up, but. Yeah, I have it as like Rome just makes plans against fenced cities for 360 years. In a sense, they're going to. So they're going to go back to the forecasting the devices for 360 years. They're just going to make it the same thing. So it says, for they shall forecast devices against him. Who's the the, the, the they? Oh, sorry, hold on. Well, um, okay, sorry. Um, verse 25. Sorry, I'm looking at first wrong verse. I was looking at 24. Uh, so it's quite similar language. Um, right. So I have, and he, Octavian, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. So he... Uh, designed the use of military means to subjugate Egypt under the rule of Anthony and Cleopatra and with a great army and the king of the south, south shall be stirred up to battle with a great, ar- great and mighty army. So preparations are made for the battle of Actium but he, yeah. Anthony, shall not stand. He will be defeated for they, Octavian's army, shall forecast devices against him so I have it here as shall devise plans to defeat Anthony. Yeah, okay, who does that? Huh? Who, who does that? Who who forecasts the devices? Octavian. Okay, so why does it say they? So why is it in Octavian's the army? Okay. So, Octavian's army, so it's just like his generals and so forth. Okay, so it's going to introduce now somebody that's not a he. But, you know, even when we deal with he, it's usually pagan Rome in its in its broadest aspects. So mm-hmm. so when we have the they, then I'm, I'm wondering uh, why why it's all of a sudden in uh, the plural. Well, obviously, Octavian's going to consult others. Mm-hmm. But he's probably always. He's always consulted others. <clears throat> all I'm saying is all through this, we have never had a they yet, right? Even when they's are implied, right? It, they's would be implied. 
but this is the first time we have the the, the masculine plural uh, personal pronoun, right? They. So I, I I just think it's a detail that we should pay attention to. But anyway, so the idea is they. Um, that's going to be Octavian and his army's defo- forecast devices against him. The him there would be. Um, Mark Antony, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, go on. Then verse 26. Yea, they, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So Cleopatra, fleeing from the battle, gave rise to Anthony, also fleeing, and his later uh, suicide in Egypt. Mm-hmm. So they that feed of the portion of his meat um, so that's, I don't know, it's maybe a bit vague applying that to uh, Cleopatra, but that's how he was killed in a sense. Mm-hmm. So uh, led to him and his army, so um, destroy him and his army. So we have here Octavian's army. So I'm not too sure whether that's applying to Anthony's or. So and his, sorry, and his army shall overflow. And many shall fall down slain. So yeah, that, that would be Octavian's army defeats Egypt and uh, killing over 5,000. Okay. Okay. So, you know, again, we're just examining, trying to figure this out. So I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by the fact that we have the they, uh, you're going to have two of them. They shall forecast devices against them. Yea, they that feed, right? So that's also going to be. Uh, part of it, and I'm just trying to figure out. Now, the they there that feed, uh, I don't see it in the Hebrew, so I don't think they is is in the word feed, but it is in um, they shall destroy. So that's probably why they put the they there, right? So it's not connected with with um, feed, the word feed or meat, but it is connected with the word. Destroy. And the word destroy means to break in pieces. <clears throat> it also can mean to buy or purchase grain, <laughs> which is weird. Okay, I'm going to look that up a little bit here. Um, yeah, because that could relate to Rome sort of uh, acquiring a lot of their food from Egypt. So they were kind of like a substantial right. grain supplier for Rome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this word, uh, so seven, uh, seven, six, six, five, that's the the Hebrew word, shabar. And, but also it's seven, six, 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 right? So there is no difference in the word itself. Okay. They're both the same word. It's, it's, you know, it's like a, a homonym. It sounds the same as a different meaning. I don't know if they have any sort of, connection like um, etymologically so 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 it actually comes from the word shabur which means grain that's seven six six eight and that's why shabar ends up um, sounding the same as seven six six five now i'm not sure why because this word means uh to break break in pieces to be broken it's the hip nifal form to shatter, to cause to break out, to be broken, to be shattered. Um, so I can see how it could relate to grain. Maybe that's where it kind of gets its origin. Now they connect it to 7663 in Strong's dictionary. And that means to scrutinize by implication of watching, to expect with hope and patience, hope, carry, view, wait. So they're saying that the, the word uh, to break is connected to the word to tear, right? So, um, so I don't know. I, I don't know which is the best way uh, to translate this. Now, if I, um, I can show you what I do here. So, you know, I can compare just a bunch of different translations that I have on my computer here. Um, so it's going to show you. They shall break him and the forces shall break up. So you're going to see it's mostly going to be translated as destroy. 
even though the word could mean it could mean um, you know to purchase grain, but nobody seems to have at least I don't see anybody translating it that way. Those that eat his food shall break him, his army shall be swept away, and then he shall fall down slain. That's just a, a, a simple version. So they keep translating it as destroy. So all these translations are just looking at it as breaking him. Those who eat up his royal rations will break him and his army will be overwhelmed. That's how it be. Those that eat his food shall destroy him. Nobody uses it in the sense of purchasing grain, even though that's what the word could mean, because everybody just takes it in that, that context. Now, if we look at words that it's trend, that it's to buy, like you'll see, the same word is in Genesis 41, 57. All the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn. So that word for to buy is Shabar because the famine was so sore. Um, it's going to be in Genesis 41, 56, where they sold unto the Egyptians, right? So you're going to have, have that same word. So that's going to be the first time it's mentioned is 4156 and then 4157. And it's used as buy and sold, right? You can see here, Shabar, Shabar, just the same, but they just have a different meaning. So being used in the sense of broken, you know, so when they break the door, obviously they're not going to buy grain, they're going to break the door. So anyway, that's, yeah, there's something there though that we, we still, I don't know if I fully, I'm just looking at the word here. So it's break, break in or buy or purchase grain to buy grain. So it's hard to tell from the form of the Hebrew, which meaning is intended, but it is they. So either they will destroy or they will buy grain. But if you, if it says those who have been eating his food shall buy grain from him, would that make sense? I mean, it would make sense, except the latter part of the verse, and his army will be, uh, his army be swept away and many fall down slain. So that's probably why they translate it as, uh, destroy or break. So in this history, can you explain it again, Stephen, exactly what is generally understood? Why, why it's going to be those that feed of the portion of his meat that shall destroy him? I mean, it's Rome gets its grain from Egypt, right? We understand that. But why would that be? Why would that be here? I mean, it seems kind of like a, an odd detail to present, to describe him in that way, to describe Rome in that way. Do you have any ideas of that? I'm just looking at what Erasmus says. He doesn't seem to make any sort of connection with the grain of Egypt. No. He just seems to be more dealing with this here battle, the back to him and the issues going along with Anthony and Octavian. Yeah, so he doesn't he doesn't really address it at all about why those why it's saying those that um, have eat the por- eating the portion of his meat, those that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So the question is, why is this here? Um, so this must be an expression that we should be able to look up. So I think the simplest thing for me to do would be look it up in the Hebrew. So I'm just going to take those two words to eat to see if this in Hebrew exists anywhere else. So I'm just going to do a search. Now you can't see what I'm doing, but it's not going to mean anything anyway. Yeah, so that's the only verse where we have that expression. I'm going to do it another way. Because sometimes it's just the spelling that's, uh, let's look in just the King James. Okay, well, we do have the portion of the king's meat in uh, Daniel 1, verse 13, and Daniel 1, verse 15. So this portion of the meat is in Daniel 1, 16, portion of the meat, the wine. Any other way that we could look it up? Like this idea of feeding uh, 398, which is a call, such a common word. Now, it's also translated other places as devour. And, you know, if we had it as, you know, more they that devour of the 
portion of his meat shall destroy him. A thought? Somebody had a thought there? Stephen, did you have a thought? Now we're going to have his army overflowing as well. So we have an overflowing. Many shall fall down slain. Okay, so this word that's translated as destroy, it's 20 years and 360 days. That is 7665. It's 20 years and 360 days. So it's just five days less than 21 years. Prophetically, it's 21 years and 105 days. What's that? In prophetic? Okay. So that's interesting. So 20 years and 105, of course, is a symbol of the 10th day. 21. 21? 21 years and 105 days. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting. But it's symbol for the 10th day of the fifth month. So, yeah. So obviously, um, but here we have, if we're going to put it as a span of time, the question is, where would we put a span of time of 21 years in our lines? I mean, if we counted from 9-11, right, and you counted 21 years less five days, um, that's going to bring you to five days less. So that'd be September 6th, 2022, right? So if we just counted from 9-11, 7665 days, September 6th, 2022, which as far as I know, doesn't mean anything. I don't know. Just just looking at it as a span of time, saying, does it have any relationship to anything? If we count from September 11th, I'm, I'm just looking at the other word, overflow, right? So I was looking at this one because I was thinking, well, it's kind of similar. I mean, it's a little bit longer, a couple hundred days longer. 7857, if you count from, oh, no, I did that wrong. So what did I do now? So 2001. Brings us to March 17th, 2023. We also, we've also already looked at 7227. Anyway, I haven't found any connections between these and spans of time yet. Now we have the portion of his meat, 6958. So if we count it from September 11th, brings me to September 29th, 2020 or September 28th, actually 2020. If it's an inclusive count, which is the 10th day of the seventh month. I don't know if that's significant. <clears throat> so anyway, we have some spans of time we could look at with these numbers. So we're going to just say feeding with the portion of his meat. So for some reason, they're going to mention this. And so the ones that are feeding up the portion of his meat is Rome, and they're going to destroy Egypt, right, in the Battle of Actium. Now, I mean, maybe part of it, you know, dealing with the feeding of the portion of his meat, and we, we know that it's, it's through the ocean that you have this food being transported. So maybe that's the connection, right? Because this is going to be a naval battle. Now, you know, it says many shall fall down slain. Uh, there isn't actually a lot of people killed in the battle. The characteristic of this is just that they're losing the battle. Cleopatra and Antony flee. But what ends up happening is the Navy is, you know, that is the Egyptian Navy people that are fighting, they're going to surrender and join with Octavian and and the same with the army, right? So, I mean, we know this is the Battle of Actium. The question is, what is actually being described? Now, I just want to look at some more of this. So, so the 7857 overflow uh, occurs in the King James 31 times. It is in Daniel 1110 and Daniel 11.26, and Daniel 11.40. So it's that word that we use in connection with the Sunday law. Often it's overflow and pass through. In this case, it's just his army shall overflow. And many shall fall down, and the fall, this means to fall, and then slain, uh, pierced, right, wounded. So it doesn't, and usually a deadly wound, right? <clears throat> So usually pierced to death or wounded to death. Okay, so are we going to be, um, how are we going to understand this, these passages? Are we, we're going to accept the battle of acting, that that's what's going to be talked about. But they that shall forecast his devices, they shall, for they shall forecast his devices against him. So let's look at that. Um, so this forecast, this just means 
to devise or weave or fabricate or plot, compute, and then devices is a contrivance, a machine, right? And it's exactly the same phrase as we have in verse 24. He shall forecast his devices against the strongholds. So this is to plan and plot against him. But it says they shall forecast devices. <clears throat> so why is it here? Um, because in the, in the previous one in verse 24, it says he shall forecast his devices. But now it's going to say they shall forecast devices or they shall forecast their devices against him. So can we account for the fact that it's, because this is an important detail. All through here we've had he's, right? We haven't had they doing anything. So is there significance in the fact that it's now uh, the masculine plural? They, sh they shall forecast devices. Can we make anything of that? Would this be giving reference to the coalition? those that have joined together to go against the king of the south. Okay, so what's the coalition consist of? Well, you were looking at this with Octavian, with those that surrendered to Octavian that can then decide that they're going to support Octavian and the way that he's approaching things. Okay, so this is... This is about forecasting devices. This is about planning and plotting. Right. I mean, those people aren't going to be planning and plotting with Octavian. And and the thing is, all through this, we could have had the plural in that case, right? So all through this, we've had the singular, singular masculine um, pronoun, right? He. He's going to do this. But that he would include more than one person. Sometimes the he is just pagan Rome. So all I'm asking is there must be a reason why they is there. And the question, and it, and it can't be just that there is now more people. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? Why? I, I don't really accept the idea that there's just some other people there because there's always been other people. But now we're going to have this they introduced. And, and the question is, why? Because it, it there's always they's there. They just never call them they's. But for the first time, they're going to refer to they. Can we, can we figure out why that is? So every place we look, when we go back, it's he, it's him. I don't see they's in this section. Can we think of any other reason why we're going to have they? I'm just going to search for the word they, how many times we get that word they. So it's going to highlight it for us, which is nice. Okay, so back in verse in verse 21, in his estate shall stand a, a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. Now that makes sense in the context of who the they is. The they is the people, right? And with the arms of the flood, Shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken? Yea, also the prince of the covenant. So, so this would be uh, the Jews, right? So you, you can see why we have a they there. So that's going to be the first they um, that is relating in anything. I mean, the robbers of the people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So we have a they there as well. Um, I don't know. And I have to check to see if the they is actually in the, at the end of the year, shall, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king. And they that brought, bought her, brought her, and they that begat her. Right. So we're going to have they's there. But those they's are different. At least I would take it as this way. This way. Because this is talking about these particular power that we have referred to as he. So, so part of the reason why I bring this up then, if they're going to forecast devices against him, uh, who's the him? Because we just say it's it's uh, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony. Is that what you're saying, Stephen? I'm just sort of going by Erasmus. Yeah. Okay. But what if the the him is actually the king of the north, the he that's mentioned at the beginning? So I'm just saying that there is. It, it's. I really want to understand this. 
Now it's going to say in verse 27, and both these king's hearts shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table. And there we can see why it's they, because it's talking about two kings, mm -hmm. both of them, right? So, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm being like a little too picky at looking at this word they, but in order to understand this verse, we have to, we have to look at everything. Is this so, thing, what's that? The they, is that sort of like some Hebrew attachment to the word forecast? Yes. It's part of the word forecast. So. They shall forecast. It's the same word as forecast in verse 24, but there's some slight difference with the Hebrew where we dot or something makes it different. Yeah, in the Hebrew there, it's he shall forecast. So if you look at, at verse, uh, here I'll switch so you can see this. So if we go, so you have the word forecast, uh, 2803, right? So if I go to the Hebrew, so here you can see the word forecast, and this is going to be uh, devices. So this is just, and he shall forecast. Or if you look um, later on, in this. Where do you get the he from there? What makes uh, it a he? Uh, that, the, the yod at the beginning. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, the next verse is not there, or it's different. No, it's, it, it's, it's what's somewhere. different is the ending. So it has a vav at the end, and if, right, and if you okay. look at the vav at the end, it's actually going to have a dot on it at the end, which means they. Okay. Right. So, so a vav I can show you here. And it actually even has uh, something that you, that I should have paid attention to as well. Um, so you're going to see this also, this here, this 3588. See that number there? This uh, key. So key, mm -hmm. which is, if you look in the King James, they're not even going to show the number. You see that? So see see here they're not going to have key, but that key is actually uh, emphasizes the idea that it's they. So I'm not sure why they don't put it there, like because it's part of the word. It's actually part of the prefix, but they show it in the Hebrew there slightly. They did, they just show it separated from it as a different number, but they don't even show the number in the King James here in the interlinear numbers. Okay, so it's they. So it's not even just that it's it's part of the word in a sense. It's also this right here. So this three five eight eight. So the way that it, the word is its its definition, I guess, is a better way to say it. Is it's uh, how they explain it. That for because when as through though because that but then certainly except surely since right. So, so it doesn't translate directly as they, but when it's attached to a word that's got the vav at the end, it's emphasizing that it's they. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird grammar. It's because it doesn't tra and that's why they don't put it there. Now it says it has all these different definitions that, for, because, when, as though, as, because, that, but, then, certainly, except, surely, since, right? So it's, a wide variety of, of of definitions, but often it goes untranslated. That is, it doesn't show up in the text. I've seen this lots of times, but it implies they because of the form of the word. So the they has to be attached to here, and and what they do actually in the Hebrew, um, my scholar's gateway. When you look at it, so when you look at it here, I'm just going to switch the screen so you can see this. So here's how they show forecast. You can see this here. That's this part. I'm just going to zoom in. So you can see how this is the word for they shall forecast. See the vav at the end with the dot after it. So that refers to the plural, masculine plural, right? So when um, <clears throat> I'm doing the parsing there. 
And then you can see that this is, they have a little dash that attaches that. I keep clicking on that, right? Does that make sense? So they show forecast. So you got the, uh, the calf and the yod with the dot there. And then you have this little dash, right? Showing that this is attached to this word. Okay. So they're going to forecast their devices. I know it's, it's, it's some of this is really, uh, picky little detail, but I, I think it's important, um, if we're going to understand this properly. Any questions about that? I know that's <clears throat> not very interesting detail, but, but it's something important for us to understand. Now you can see actually it's interesting over here. They do actually have 3588 here. So I said we didn't have it in the King James. Maybe we do. Oh yeah, under the word four. So they have it translated as four. Okay. Okay. So they do have the word there translated as four, but it's connected to forecast. So when they have that and they have the they, then it's they. They shall forecast devices against him. Okay. <clears throat> so they did put it in there. I just didn't see it. Okay. So we can say that they are going to forecast their devices against him. So before we had them for he forecasting his devices against the strongholds. What if we, we took this as the they referring to the strongholds forecasting devices against him? Does that make sense that we take it as a reverse? Does that make sense that people understand what I'm asking? So it says, you know, um, he shall forecast his devices against him. Right now we're saying, well, okay, so where was this here? So he's going to forecast his devices against the strongholds, right? He shall forecast his devices against the strongholds. But now we're having, and they shall forecast their devices against him, right? So what if this is a reverse? What if, if the strongholds are forecasting the devices against him? Because first he's going to forecast his devices from the strongholds or against the strongholds. But now they, the strongholds, are going to forecast their devices against him. Does that make any sense? So the they, you're putting it back to verse 24? Yes, to the strongholds. And this, this would make sense litera literary, right? In, in a literary sense. Then, then there would be something that we could understand. So that this would be... How are you going to apply, apply it? So the strongholds there would be about the fence cities that Rome's going to conquer or seek to conquer for at least, at least 60 years. Okay, so at the beginning, right, so we're going to be starting with the Battle of Actium. That's going to be the beginning of the 360 years, right? Mm -hmm. So even though Rome is forecasting its devices against the strongholds, here at the beginning, they're going to be forecasting their devices against Rome. And that would be, you know, e Egypt and so all these things that happened in the Battle of Actium. Now, is it true that Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and and others forecast their devices against Rome in the Battle of Actium, but that's just what it could be referring to. Well, yeah, I think so. So, okay, so that would make sense. It's basically Greece against Rome, right? Greece against Rome, and so yes, that would be the response. Right. So he forecasts his devices from the strongholds even for a time. But at the beginning of that period, they're also going to be plotting against Rome. Now, and that's true that this is a plot against Rome and, and Octavian. Because in the Battle of Actium, it's the king of the south stirring up its army to come against Rome. Right. Now, technically, they call it a civil war, call it, uh, yeah, it's, it's a naval battle in the last war of the Roman Republic. It led to the end of the Ptolemaic Egypt and the birth of the Roman Empire. And so we have this battle of Actium, and that's what we're studying. So in early 31 BC, in the year, the year of the battle, Antony and Cleopatra were temporarily stationed at Greece. Mark Antony 
possessed 500 ships, 70,000 infantry, and made his camp at Actium. And Octavian, with 400 ships and 80,000 infantry, arrived from the north and occupied Tria and Corinth, where he managed to cut Antony's southward communications with Egypt. And I believe that he's going to be uh, blocking this naval blockade where he cuts off some of the food supply, if I remember correctly from what I saw on, on YouTube. So definitely he is stirring up um, or, or forecasting his devices against Antony. Okay, so I'm just reading some answer. So, I mean, that's a possibility just to take it, it that way. Um, I'm just seeing if uh, Swearingen says anything. Okay, so let's go there. Okay, so when reading this verse, the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. And then the King James says, for they shall forecast devices against him. So the king of the south here is called a he, but then it's going to say, for they shall forecast devices against him. Now the for, of course, is just you know, an interpretation of a word that can have lots of different meanings. So after Caesar's death in 44 BC, the king of the south would be stirred up to battle once again, coming with a great and mighty army against the king of the north. This would become a reality through the influence of Mark Antony, whose authority over Egyptian affairs after the death of Caesar had essentially made him the king of the south. While pagan Rome, under the authority of Octavian, would constitute the king of the north. This growing rivalry would lead to an inevitable showdown for control of the Roman world. Antony had initially formed an alliance known as the Second Triumvirate with both Octavian and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus with the express purpose of eliminating the murderers of Caesar and removing their own political opponents. When the Triumvirs divided the empire in 40 BC, Antony assumed control of the eastern provinces, which would include Egypt, thus making him the king of the south. While Octavian would retain portions of the north and west, which would include Rome itself, thus making him the king of the north. As it turned out, Antony's involvement in Egypt would expose him to the romantic suggestions of Cleopatra, who had murdered Ptolemy XIII after the death of Caesar. Despite his marriage to Octavia, the sister of Octavian, Antony would become romantically involved with the Egyptian queen, queen, thus alienating Octavian and turning public favor against him in Rome. As a result, he would become increasingly dependent upon Cleopatra and the resources of Egypt for his own political support. He made matters worse when he held an excessive military triumph in Alexandria, not Rome, after his defeat of Armenia in 34 BC, thus strengthening public opinion in favor of Octavian. Finally, in 32 BC, he publicly broke with Octavian by divorcing Octavia, which then provoked Octavian to declare war on Egypt. At this point, Antony became totally committed as the king of the south. Octavian's declaration of war against Egypt in behalf of pagan Rome um, stirred him up to battle as the king of the north with a very great and mighty army. Antony would challenge the authority of the young grand nephew of Caesar by crossing into Greece with Cleopatra at his side in 31 BC and through their combined forces, established military strongholds along the western coast of Greece. So what we would say then is that the, they would refer to uh, the fact that they, they're they in Greece, right? So they're using, they're, this is a, in a sense a war of Egypt and Greece against Rome. Would you, would you agree with that, Stephen? That the they then can refer to these strongholds such as in Greece? So the they then is responding. Well, I suppose Greece had been uh, subjugated by Rome at that time, but there would have been elements that would be resistant to that who may then have joined with Mm -hmm. the Ptolemy's aspect of Greece. I haven't really thought about it. Yeah. Uh, Octavian viewed this move as an attack against the empire itself and forecasting devices against Antony, dispatched the famous Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, his best friend and former schoolmate, to go ahead of him and attempt to check Antony's military aggression. Meeting with some initial success, Agrippa would capture several key positions from Antony along the Greek coastline, 
As it turned out, by the time Octavian had arrived in Greece to join up with Agrippa, Antony had been cornered in the Gulf of Ambracia as he attempted to break out of the situation. The naval forces of each side would meet head on just outside the Gulf near a place called Actium. Even though Antony and Cleopatra had superior numbers in the ensuing naval battle, Cleopatra would abandon her partner at the height of the conflict. Coming to realize that Octavian had the upper hand, she would withdraw her naval forces and retreat to Egypt, leaving Antony to suffer in a humiliating defeat. He eventually managed to escape to Egypt also. Actually, he, he jumped out of the boat he was in and swam to a boat in, or ship in her fleet. Is how he got to Egypt. Not sure why he doesn't mention this. Anyway, when the land of the Nile fell to his rival in the next year, Antony would not stand, committing suicide with Cleopatra, thus allowing Octavian to emerge as master of the Roman world. Then they say, Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So it's just like it's his interpretation here. Yea, they, um, so this passage reviews the fact that because Cleopatra had removed her naval support from Antony at the height of the Battle of Actium, she who once fed the portion of his meat would eventually destroy him. Having stood by his side in the past, as his lover while offering both political support and necessary supplies for the development and maintenance of his army and naval forces, she would eventually leave him to be defeated by Octavian. And as Octavian's army would later overflow into Egypt and conquer this last remaining Hellenistic kingdom, many would fall down slain. So here, so the one who is destroying him is, is basically Cleopatra and Egypt is going to destroy the king of the south. Does that make sense, this interpretation? Not really. Okay. So what would be... What, okay, Stephen? Yeah, I think Smith is something similar. So the, the him then is is Mark Antony, right? And he's he's going to be slain because of... But see, you know, they that fought of the peace of... Pe- a feed of the portion of the of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, right? So obviously the army that overflows is the king of the north's army. And and so the him here is obviously not the one whose army overflows. This would have to be the king of the south. But that doesn't make sense. They that feed of the portion of his meat. So who's the his? Is that Egypt's? Because you, you understand what I'm saying. This interpretation doesn't make sense to me because it says she who once fed the portion of his meat, right? So this is saying Cleopatra, but we don't see a feminine here. And it should be she who once fed him the portion of his meat would eventually destroy him if you would. Um, Because it actually doesn't even make sense as a sentence to say uh, she who once fed the portion of his meat would eventually destroy him. She who once fed him the portion of his meat would eventually destroy him is what I'm understanding him to say. And and she just eventually leaves him to be defeated by Octavian. That's much different than actually av- uh, directly destroying him. So I'm having problems with this. It, it, I mean, it would make more sense that the ones that are fed, um, that receive the portion of his meat, is actually Rome. And the him, of course, is Mark Antony. And then his army shall overflow. That's the king of the north. So I wouldn't put Cleopatra in there in, in this. And then we still have to address, uh, again, both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but shall not, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So if we're going to say both these kings are, are Mark Antony and uh, Octavian, right? That's kind of what we're saying. That's what we've been understanding, right? Yeah, well, Egypt was uh, considered the breadbasket of Rome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was certainly in the imperial times. But I'm just wondering, can we concert, confirm the history that uh, these verses are talking about are relating also that it was either at that their time? Yeah, it was. So Egypt is providing most of the grain for 
the the Mediterranean region. I mean, in, the fact is, for instance, um, from what I've seen about uh, the Battle of Actium, Octavian's uh, navy, I mean, he presses Antony into this naval battle in a, in a bad position in a bad time because he's cutting off the supplies of grain. So they're capturing all the supplies of grain coming from Egypt uh, to Greece. So his, his army is starving. That's one of the reasons they, they, they surrender because <clears throat> they're in a bad way, right? So, <clears throat> and th- this is the case. So yeah, Egypt is providing the grain for this whole area. So they that feed of the portion of his meat this would be Rome. So the king of the north had been dependent upon the king of the south for grain, but it's going to destroy the king of the south. So this idea, Cleopatra abandoned Antony during Actium. So I wouldn't take that interpretation. So they that feed of the portion of his meat, so Rome is dependent upon Egypt for grain. So this here, this Cleopatra abandoned Antony during Actium has nothing to do with it. Well, I guess we could put it in here. The his army, that's going to be Octavian's. I just have a Wikipedia article that says, with the incorporation of Egypt into the Roman Empire and under mm-hmm. the direct rule of Emperor Augustus, Egypt mm-hmm. became Rome's main source of grain. I'm not too sure how much before that uh, Egypt was supplying grain to Rome. Yeah, well, from what I had read, it was, but I'd have to look that up again. And now it's a portion of his meat, right? So it's not all of his meat. Yeah, I think the Hebrew word is like dainties. Um, for for meat. Yes, delicacies, that type of thing. Yeah, so it could be referring to, yeah, so meat, a dainty, a portion or provision of meat. So very strange Hebrew word path bag. <laughs> it's actually a Persian origin. So it might refer to more than just because in Daniel, it's going to only exist in Daniel. Right. So you're going to see it in Daniel chapter one, verse five. Uh, this is this uh, uh, of the king's meat. Right. So that's going to be part of it. In so it's in Daniel chapter one. And and then only mentioned in Daniel chapter 11 in verse 26. So that's something else to consider. So maybe it has to do with some of the delicacies and stuff that come from Egypt. So so there's going to be think, more things that we have to examine. So thanks for bringing up that point. So it's it's always sorting out these, you know, who's the he's, who who is the he, who is the him, who is the his, right, who is the they. That, that sometimes is quite difficult in, in, in Hebrew to sort through who is being referred to. But the other thing is that it says that both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, right? So one of the questions that we would have is it's going to talk about the Battle of Actium, which is the start of this forecasting his devices from the strongholds. And then it's going to go back to them speaking lies at one table, right? So it's going to go back to their alliance beforehand. So in some ways, um, we could actually say that this battle of Actium here is placed parenthetically into this narrative. Does that make sense? Because it's talking about Rome and and this period of time, which we, we say can be from... Uh, 48 BC to 313 and also marked as uh, 31 BC to 330 AD. So it's talking about what Rome is going to do. Then it goes to this battle of Actium and then, so it goes to the battle of Actium and then it's going to go back to both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak lies at one table, right? And this is, mischief is in the sense of wickedness. And, and this is going to be falsehood or deceit, the lies, right, at one table. And that word table refers often to a meal, right? It's Hebrew 7, 9, 7, 9. But it shall not prosper, that is, push forward, 
yet the end shall be at the appointed time. And so we're going to have another appointed time, a time appointed, which Uriah Smith is going to place as the end of the 360 years in 330. Okay? So that's kind of what we're going to start. You know, We're going to try to pull all this together. I know it's a lot of information. But tomorrow we're going to look at, at verse 26 or, or 27. Both these kings' hearts will be to do mischief and, and try to see why we're going back. And any questions before we close here? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. And um, we just pray, Lord, that uh, as we study through it today and come together tomorrow, we can bring some of these things together. Uh, thank you for the light that's shining upon our path. And for each person who is studying, we pray for one another, Lord, that you can strengthen us, encourage us in the difficulties that we face each day. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name.